when are we going to start getting some of these big moves? When am I going to see Cortland Sutton or Garrett Bowles or Jerry Judy or Justin Simmons come across my timeline? We certainly saw it with the Bills this afternoon, Mace. When do you expect the Broncos to start making moves with household names? I think we'll start seeing it in the next couple of days. Of course, they've got until next Wednesday, technically, to get these things done. It's not until next Wednesday, the start of the league year, when they've got to have everything lined up and uh, be in compliance uh, salary cap-wise as they start the new league year. I think everything going down with Buffalo, though, Will, I think that's sort of why in the last couple of hours you've seen people saying, okay, all right, when's it going to start to happen with the Broncos? And uh, I get that, but at the same time, I think we're all kind of, uh, you know, recovering from the whirlwind of, you know, learning that things were finalized with Russell Wilson. They were moving on. I feel like it was sort of like a hurricane that you knew was coming through and then it came through and you got to clean up a little bit before you move on with the rest of it. Yeah, that makes sense. You're right. The big news with Russ came on Monday afternoon. I think Broncos fans are just impatient because they, like you said, they see Buffalo making all these moves today and they're thinking, okay, when is our turn? We'll certainly keep an eye on that. Keep you posted at denversports.com and right here on the fan. But let's talk about Russell Wilson because Mace, Adam Schefter broke the news this morning and you wrote about it at denversports.com that Russell Wilson is now allowed to start visiting with other teams. Is this just a courtesy from the Broncos or what do you make of this? Because technically they haven't cut him yet. They just have informed him that they will cut him starting a week from today. Yeah, it's a bit of a courtesy. What you're doing is you're giving him a chance to get somewhere and get a head start on it. Now, that being said, I think the head start is a little bit overblown because we know that whether you're talking about a team trading for Justin Fields, you're talking about Kirk Cousins, whether he might go somewhere, there are increasing rumblings that Cousins may be bound for the Atlanta Falcons, which would have an impact on the Broncos if they choose to draft a quarterback. Um, So it gives a chance for a little bit of a jump start in terms of Russell Wilson being able to sit down in person with teams. But the truth is, the groundwork, even on Russell Wilson and his uh, representation side of it, all that was starting to be laid last week at the Combine over, you know, over cold pops and whatnot at Prime and St. Elmo's and other spots. Yeah, a few jumbo shrimp cocktails, maybe something like that. I'm with you. I, I, I think we would be naive to say, oh, Russell Wilson and his team haven't talked with anyone else, and this news of him getting cut came out of nowhere, and he just prepared this statement, and now now he's ready to explore his next options. I get that, but I also think that the Broncos could play hardball here and say, no, 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 you can't talk to anyone until everyone else can, the Kirk Cousins and the Baker Mayfields of the world. But maybe, just maybe, for as, in my eyes, poorly as they treated Russ at the end, they are sort of doing him a little bit of a solid here that could ultimately let him land a starting job because you and I have talked about it. It is a game of musical chairs, and we all think Russ is going to land a chair. But, Mace, there is also a scenario where if Justin Fields gets traded and Kirk Cousins switches teams and Minnesota takes a first round draft pick and Baker goes back to Tampa and Mike Tomlin wants to see things out with some of his younger guys. Like there's a, there's a scenario there where all of a sudden Russ doesn't have a chair at the table. So maybe the Broncos are doing him a solid here that he actually has a better chance of being a 2024 starter than if they delayed him for another week. I mean, you start going through all those, especially Pittsburgh, maybe deciding that the, Mason Rudolph, Kenny Pickett tandem is worth running it back with. And you really start looking and saying, okay, how many options might Russell Wilson have here? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, New England, for example, that may appear to be a place where Russell Wilson might fit, but if they draft a quarterback number three overall, or if they decide to trade down and then trade back into the first round and maybe take Michael Penix Jr. At the end, of round one either way you're talking about a quarterback for the Patriots coming in as a rookie and is Russell Wilson really a bridge quarterback at this point in time for the Patriots if they're doing that someone like Jacoby Brissett may fit the bill more somebody who's kind of been on that fringe between starter and backup and has also proven that he can handle 
being a backup pretty well. I mean, Russell Wilson only had the two weeks of being a backup when he knew he was on his way out the door to go by, so you don't really know if Russell Wilson is the right man for the particular job of being a bridge quarterback slash backup somewhere else. Yeah, no, I, I think you're making a lot of sense there, and, and would Russ hold a clipboard? Right? Would Russ hold a clipboard to start next year, or is a clipboard, of course I'm talking about being a backup quarterback, not fit with his ego, and would instead he sit on the sidelines, sit out, not report to a training camp, wait for the first guy to get carted off, because we know a QB gets carted off every year, and then go sign a deal to be a starter in August. I don't know, but I also think that's a bigger possibility than maybe some folks are considering that Russ won't find a new home in the next week or two, that if the chairs don't line up, he's just going to sit on the sideline till that golf cart comes out, and then he'll go play for Team X once they need a quarterback a week, two weeks, three weeks before the season starts. I mean, you remember Brett Favre back in 09 just deciding to kind of wait and wait and wait after he'd been with the Jets the previous year, and I think he showed up for the Vikings in the middle of August. Right. Uh, we've seen it at other positions uh, nine years ago, Bronco fans, you might remember Evan Mathis, who was coming off, I believe, an all-pro season the previous year, but a veteran, and the market initially was quiet, and he just decided, you know, I'm going to wait for the best time, the best spot, and that proved to be late August with the Broncos signing and becoming a starting guard on a team that won the Super Bowl. And, of course, if you, in baseball, you see it all the time with pictures these days in free agency. I mean, like Blake Snell won the Cy Young Award, and he's – still on sign now some of that is how the market goes but there becomes a, there comes a certain point will where you're simply better off waiting for the injury to happen the injury to a quarterback in baseball for a starting picture to tears ucl you know that might be his best play if there is nothing here in that first week and that's something i mean it may be wild to think about russell wilson not being in anybody's camp as you get into OTAs, it's not out of the realm of possibility at all. Yeah, I think it's definitely something we need to consider. I think it's something that fans around the NFL probably haven't given much thought to. But, yes, if he doesn't get a new team in this first wave, that could be his future is the waiting game months and months and months. Uh, before we get on to some spicy comments from Mike Greenberg today on ESPN Radio, let's go ahead and have you handicap that. What are the odds? And, and I guess I'm looking for percentages, and this is just your opinion. I'm not saying you're sourcing this or anything, but just your opinion. What are the odds Russ picks a new team in the next week or two? And what are the odds it could be months and months for Russell Wilson um, before he finds a new home? I'd still say it's more likely than not that he picks a new team in the next two weeks. And I'd even go as far as to say I think that new team would be the Las Vegas Raiders. Whoa! <laughs> a mace bomb on a Wednesday night, the Raiders. Now, that's interesting because they've been sort of in the peripheral, but we've heard a lot of the Falcons and a lot of the Steelers, a little bit of chatter about the Raiders. But, man, you're now putting Russell Wilson to the Raiders in the next two weeks as sort of your bold prediction, if you will. Is that, uh, you know, some combine intel or just a gut? It's a gut. It's a gut feeling, but it's also sort of looking at the, the landscape of where this is going. Pittsburgh, by all accounts, appears poised to go with perhaps Kenny Pickett and Mason Rudolph, run it back with them for a season, still maybe in the Justin Fields conversation. Uh, Atlanta, there's all sorts of smoke and rumblings that if it's not Fields, it might be Kirk Cousins coming in. And football-wise, Will, that would make a heck of a lot of sense because you've got Zach Robinson coming in to run that offense under Raheem Morris. It's going to be the shanahan McVay scheme. And we know that Kirk Cousins ran that scheme very well in Minnesota before he got injured this past year. Uh, that's the kind of move that I think would allow Atlanta to take a shortcut back to contention in – an NFC that has considerably fewer landmines in the AFC. So it's just kind of a process of elimination thing. You have, you know, Antonio Pierce is coming in. Now the Raiders are taking a long, hard look at the quarterbacks. They were like the Broncos were interviewing all of them, but they may regard Russell Wilson as a shortcut back in the AFC West. And yeah, there may be the little emotional thing of trying to, uh, one up and on a division rival there and 
honestly, don't you think that notion would make Russ pretty excited to stay in the division? Oh, of course. And the Raiders have beaten the Broncos eight times in a row, and he's looking to make it nine and ten next year and say, I told you so, while the Raiders are challenging the Chiefs, which may sound a little silly because the Chiefs have won three Super Bowls in the last five years. But also the Chiefs weren't anything special for the majority of the regular season this year. Heck, 11 wins could have gotten you the AFC West title. So maybe you're right. Maybe the Raiders do look at it as, hey, the Chiefs are just a playoff team more than anything else. And Russell Wilson could get us to the top. And yes, the the late Al Davis would be licking his chops at this move. And you got to think Mark Davis probably thinks some of the same way of anything we can do to stick it to the Broncos, we will do. And Russell Wilson could be a very intriguing option out there in Las Vegas. Yeah. I just figured I'd go for the spiciest possible option, right? Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate <laughs> spice. Speaking of spice, that's what Mike Greenberg did on ESPN radio today. He is the latest national media member to just go off on the Broncos and particularly say how they handled everything with Russ Let's listen to a little bit from Greeny, and then Mace, I want your reaction because these comments are certainly getting a lot of attention. So this is the national narrative, Mace, that it is the Broncos' fault and not Russell Wilson's fault. And I would say 90-plus percent of people outside of this bubble we live in blame the Broncos and not Russ, which is a shift because we know Russ was the laughingstock of the NFL in 2022. But the narrative has totally flipped 180 degrees. You just heard what Mike said there. Any truth to where he's coming from on this, that this debacle, the word he used, is the Broncos' fault and not Russell Wilson's fault? Uh, I'd say it's not, uh, it's not exactly the way he's saying as Zach by would say, two things can be true at the same time. Okay. I'm thinking back to some of the conversations I had with people around the league, around the national media sphere during Super Bowl week. And it, it was both. Russell Wilson had a pretty good season. Hearing that from guys like Phil Simms, Boomer Esiason, Matt Ryan. Yep. But it also could not be patched together with Sean Payton that they were too different in terms of what Payton wanted to do and what Russell Wilson could do. Like, it, So it's one of those things where you – and also you look at the top line numbers on Russell Wilson and they're good. Like the touchdown interception ratio, that's a you know that that was a healthy number this year. You start diving to some of the the metrics below EPA per play, success rate, uh, ESPN QBR, and you you get a tale that tells you he was very mid tier at best. And then of course there's a the factor, and this is what comes into some of the national media and uh, pundits with whom I spoke, that Sean Payton wants to do one thing and Russell Wilson isn't good at that. Sean Payton wants a rhythm and timing quarterback who's a relatively low-variance quarterback, and Russell Wilson is as best beyond play structure and play design, and you're going to have to live with high-variance, massive ups and downs, and some of the best plays being completely off script, right? I think it was sure. uh, Doug Farrar of USA Today, uh, who actually is based in Seattle, and uh, no, you know, so he's well versed in all things Russell Wilson. I mean, the term he used when chatting with Cecil Lammy and I last week at the combine, Sean Payne has a beautiful offense, and he wants to see it run a certain way, and, that, and that's not what Russell Wilson can do. Okay, and, and I'm hearing everything you're saying, but what we played already was just the tip of the iceberg. Greeny mm-hmm. goes even further, and this is now where we start getting into the strong accusation territory. And I won't set, or I will set it up for you, but I don't want to spoil the surprise he basically says that sean payton wanted russell wilson to fail
So this is where we get into the nitty gritty of Peyton criticizing Russell Wilson for texting Drew Brees too much last winter, said he needed to stop acting like a politician and kissing babies. And Sean wanted to hang out with Joe Montana more at the Super Bowl than he did Russell Wilson. To Greeny's point, he didn't really like him from the start and is not sabotage because that's probably too strong of word, but that he basically set him up to fail because he wanted to run him out the door. This is where it gets dicey for me, Mace, because these are strong accusations, strong allegations that somehow Sean Payton intentionally did this so Russell Wilson no longer had to be his quarterback. Yeah, and I don't buy them. And, and one of the reasons why I don't, I really don't buy them is – the quickest way back and the cleanest way to deal with what the Broncos had contractually in terms of cat and cap and also team building was to figure out if Russell Wilson could actually run this offense and, and get it right. And had he done so, I think there would have been a detente if not an outright thawing in terms of the sentiments between Sean Payton and Russell Wilson, right? But Sean Payton was also the third choice. Like we have to be, yeah. we have to be cognizant of that. If they wanted Jim Harbaugh, they wanted D'Amico Ryan's. They sort of quote unquote settled for Sean Payton. Would Harbaugh or Ryan's have been a better fit with Wilson? I think it's fair to say probably because Sean was about the worst fit possible that there could have been. Well, I think with D'Amico Ryan's, it would have been. Shanahan McVay offense and we've seen Russell Wilson running off an offense that was a descendant of that in Seattle before he came to Denver right, right. so if it had been D'Amico Ryan's I think the whole it, it, that part would have gone more smoothly I don't think there's any doubt Jim Harbaugh that would have been interesting now that being said Jim Harbaugh in San Francisco with Greg Roman as his offensive coordinator you know, they had Alex Smith and Colin Kaepernick, and neither one of them were real on rhythm, strictly within structure quarterbacks at that point. Right. Alex Smith was still doing a lot of things with his legs, and then he got injured, and then Colin Kaepernick was a true dual threat quarterback operating in the system under Greg Roman and Jim Harbaugh and got him all the way to the Super Bowl. So I think it would have there would have been more tolerance and ability to kind of handle the fact that Wilson was a high variance quarterback compared to uh, the more rhythm and timing based quarterbacks that operate within a system and you would have been living with the extreme highs and sometimes the lows of three and out, three and out, three and out because he's not operating in the pocket in the same way as other quarterbacks would. Well, and then here's Greenberg. This is the last one I'll play from him. Basically saying the Broncos should have never hired Sean Payton. And that might be his best point of the morning, Mace, of you gave a quarter billion dollars to Russell Wilson. Nathaniel Hackett was an utter disaster. Of course you had to move on from Hackett, but you needed, because you committed so much to Russ, to find a coach that was not only going to work with Russ, but tailor his system towards Russ. And Sean Payton was not that guy. Sean, as we know, is quite stubborn, quite confident in his own system. And I do think that hindsight 2020 – you either make Sean Payton the head coach and you don't give Russell Wilson a quarter billion or you give Russell Wilson a quarter billion and you hire someone besides Sean Payton. Is that fair to say at least? It's fair to say, but also there's the issue of the ownership transition coming into play, right? Because the trade goes down in March and that trade doesn't happen without the promise of an extension because Russell Wilson had to waive the no trade clause. And that isn't happening without an agreement like, okay, we're going to take care of you extension wise. And then three months later, we learned that the Walton Penner group has purchased the team. And two months after that, they actually assume control. Uh, the one thing that you couldn't do if you were coming in would be to look at that organizational promise and say, uh, yeah, we're not 
going to do that. I mean, that's and that's a little bit different than asking to delay an injury guarantee. That's like saying, okay, you, you walked in, you thought you were going to get $124 million, and uh, no, sorry, we're going to you know punt on that just because we changed management teams. So that so basically, I, this is to some degree a product of just everything kind of getting settled with a transition with the Walton, with Greg Penner and Kerry Walton Penner learning about the landscape, learning frankly what they wanted in a head coach, because whether it was going to be Jim Harbaugh or D'Amico Ryans or then Sean Payton, it was wanting a head coach with a clear vision and an ability to shape the organization to what they wanted what they believed in rather than what they had with Nathaniel Hackett, which was, you know, some, you know, unorthodox ideas and kind of a, a muddled vision in the end that helped lead to his demise as a head coach. Yeah. Day three since Russell Wilson has been released and the takes keep coming in fast and furious. You can read more about Mike Greenberg's nine minute rant at denversports.com. He certainly makes some interesting points. Some that I think are fair, some that might be a little off base. In the meantime, we're putting a big emphasis on YouTube. So if you could help us grow our Denver Sports YouTube channel, most importantly by subscribing, we would really appreciate it. And of course, liking, commenting, sharing, all of that gives us a big boost on the Denver Sports YouTube channel.